from the land of sky blue waters, welcome to the Soda Pod. Ishidroma here, and I'll be joined by Seth Topal shortly. And I thank you all for joining wherever and whenever you are listening. We've got a big show planned for you today. Big shout out to Seth, who stayed on longer than we originally planned. And thank you all for your patience. I know I said and I tweeted from the Soda Pod account at Soda Pod on Twitter that this would be out late afternoon, early evening. Life has just gotten in the way of everything content creation wise. On my YouTube channel, I had to stream less. My other YouTube channel, The City Life Project. I had to stream less this weekend. Easter Sunday responsibilities kind of took precedent. Didn't want to bug Seth to record late on Sunday night as he was hanging out with his family and he got home late as well. So we had a great recording earlier here today on Monday. But again, just thank you guys for your continued support and my apologies for this being very, very late. But I'm blaming Easter. I'm blaming the long weekend. We all had shit to do. Today on the show, we will dive in to some Minnesota wild talk really do a deep dive and highlight some key aspects of the Vegas Golden Knights loss. It's over, ladies and gentlemen. The math doesn't matter. I know they're not officially eliminated. I mean, by the time you listen to this, they might be, but it's over. The Wild ain't making the playoffs. It ain't happening. Some positive news, though, and this wasn't an April Fool's tweet a la Michael Russo. Liam Ugrin is coming over to North America, and he's going to play the remainder of the season with the Iowa Wild. So that's pretty cool. There's something there for us to dissect keep our eyes on as well as Ian Hoppy I'm sure we'll dive into that on the Wednesday episode of Judd's Buds reminder you can catch Judd's Buds live on our YouTube channel the City Life Project every Wednesday 6 30 p.m central if you want to be part of the show if you want to be part of the live chat and that great community that they are building on our channel there be sure to drop by every Wednesday 6 30 p.m central and if you want your college hockey intake <laughs> the Gophers St. Cloud Bemidji, Duluth, St. Thomas, the Mavericks. They ain't nobody in the Frozen Four. And of course, it's being hosted in Minnesota. It should still be a lot of fun. I'll be posted up at Tom Reed's pretty much that whole Thursday, potentially even Saturday as well. So if you guys want to hang out there and you don't have any tickets, I will be posted up there. I'll be hitting up Barrel Theory. I'll be hitting up Bad Weather in St. Paul as well. So Hit me up on social at VI Sports Talk or our account at SotaPod. Or just comment on this video if you're watching on YouTube. Happy to meet you guys. Happy to hang out. Happy to drink a couple beers with you guys as well. So we will dive into some Minnesota Wild Talk here today. And there's also some NHL tidbits that we will cover as well. Another 1,000 NHL game milestone for Washington Capitals player. Austin Matthews, potentially, arguably, now the best goal scorer in the National Hockey League. We'll talk a little bit about recent deaths in the world of hockey. Pay our respect, but also talk about what the media and hockey fans are saying about the way that these two men left us. Oh, and we can't not address the whole Andrew Berkshire situation that occurred last week. Now, I know we're a little late to the party here, but we literally recorded our episode, posted it, and then all this transpired. And again, big shout out to my boy, Seth. I know I can be a crazy fuck. I don't pretend to be an expert on any of the sports that I cover, on any of the sports that I'm passionate about talking about. I am just that. I'm a passionate fan of the sport of hockey. I'm a passionate fan of fighting in lacrosse, box lacrosse, real lacrosse, hockey, as well as combat sports. But I have my opinions and I'm going to use my platform to talk about them. That is what this is. It is a podcast and I'd love to interact with you guys as well. Join our conversation. Let us know what you think on our opinions, my opinion especially. And a big shout out to Seth for riding shotgun throughout this episode in particular where I got a little emotional at times, we'll say. Upon looking back and editing this, it wasn't as bad as I thought in certain cases, but I'm going to be shamelessly me in regards to some of these topics here, even some of the more tough ones like fighting in hockey and the link between that and some of, well, the tragedies that we've been hearing about, the deaths 
in this sport. And in regards to the Andrew Berkshire situation, Seth and I have a lot to say on how he presented that whole argument. But I also have some things to say on how people are taking it a step further and bringing in connections to dots that I quite think are foolish. All that and more soon, ladies and gentlemen. But let us first start with the hoppy hour. That's right. We have our weekly beer vlog. We have our weekly hoppy hour coming up next year. And it is brought to you by our friends at Northland Vodka. Northland Vodka is the best damn vodka in the world, not just the state of Minnesota, in the world, ladies and gentlemen. I never have to drink Russian vodka again. Not that I can even get any right now, but you don't need to drink any Russian vodka again. Northland is local and it's incredible. And not only that, the people that work there are incredible too. They have an amazing team. Mark Parrish, and everybody there are so amazing to work with, as well as meet Mark Parrish will be at the Maple Grove Total Wine in a couple of weeks as well. If you want to meet him, meet the team, get a signed bottle, maybe a signed jersey, then make sure to go check them out and be sure to follow them on social media so you know when all the signings, when all the meet and greets are coming up this spring and summer. The best thing about this vodka, other than how amazing it tastes, is that a percentage of sales go right back into the community, go right back into supporting local hockey. Great product, even better people and we're proud to be working with them here on the Soda Pod. So go get you some Northland today. If it's not on the shelf of your local liquor store, ask them why. And hopefully we can make that happen soon. Northland Vodka, a proud partner of the Soda Pod. Let's get into the hoppy hour. First, I'd like to propose a toast to UMD goaltender Alex Stalock. To Stalock. To Stalock. I love that stuff. Been drinking it for years. You know, I, I heard they recently decided to add more hops to it. You're all hopped out. We will do the beer vlogs until we drink a beer from every freaking glass, ladies and gentlemen. That is the name of the game. Will not stop until every beer on these shelves are drunk. I'm getting drunk just looking at them all. Welcome back to another edition of the Hoppy Hour here on the Soda Pod, ladies and gentlemen. And today we have a beer from a brewery that I've actually never been to and that I've actually never tried a single can, single version, a unique beer of theirs. Now, I've only ever had a Falling Knife beer when they've been collaborating with other breweries. And we're gonna start with the Eye of Heaven Hazy IPA. Now, this is a Hazy IPA with Strata, Simcoe, and Cryopop Hops. Our boy Hoppy and the masses on Untapped have rated this one 3.85, 3.7 out of five, which on tap, as you know, if you get a, <laughs> if you get a four and above, I mean, it's liquid gold. The thing is basically saffron. But uh, excited to try this one. Let's take a taste. Cheers, everybody. Whoa. Wow. I can see why our boy Hoppy likes it. This is very, very good. Oh my god. 
goodness. Super refreshing. And honestly, I wish it was a little bit colder. Just go back from the liquor store, put it in the fridge prior to us recording here. But I mean, it was sitting out in the car for a little bit. And I wish this was like ice cold upon drinking it. But my goodness, this is, this is very, very good. Okay, so it's coming in at 6.7%. Love the drink fresh. Thumbs up Don Cherry approved. Can art is on point as well. I mean, look at this acid trip of a can here. You'd think it was freaking Drecker. Shout out to the Drecker video we did last week. And big shout out to our boy Ganskow as he suggested that we do a plop next time we dive into a Drecker. I mean, it's hard to screw up an IPA that has Simcoe and Cryo hops, let's be perfectly honest. But what I'm getting from this is a very creamy and citrus forward IPA. Now on Untapped, a lot of the reviews said that it was oat forward. I don't necessarily get that. Definitely agree that it's a little bit more smoother, thicker, creamier. It's not that bitter. I feel like kind of the thickness and richness of it balances out that citra and thus kind of the bitterness of the hops, but it's still there. It's almost like, it's almost like a thick blood orange type beer. That, that's kind of the way that I would describe this, like blood orange juice, but in, in, in an IPA form. Definitely matches the percentage of alcohol. I wouldn't think upon drinking this that it would be anything more than six, 7% and it coming in pretty much right in between at 6.7 is where I would have determined it to be upon the first uh, taste. But no, this is incredible. Like I said, very refreshing despite it being thicker, richer, creamier. Yeah, I mean, this is one you could definitely crack in the dead of winter and or the summer, but if you're gonna crack it outside, if you're gonna crack it in this beautiful spring time, make sure it's cold. As always, make sure your beer is cold, but make sure it's very crisp. Make sure it's ice cold. That's kind of my only complaint and it's a personal complaint here. I, I should have let this marinate. I should have let this sit a bit longer in the fridge, but I was just so stoked to try it, ladies and gentlemen. So again, falling knife, eye of heaven, if I'm gonna rate this out of five. Honestly, I'll give it a 3.7 as well. I think that's the perfect rating for it and I would absolutely pick up one of these again. Go check them out, Falling Knife Brewery. They have some amazing beers that they do in collaboration with other breweries in Minnesota. Nothing short of incredible. Cheers, everybody. If you like these beer reviews, if you have any suggestions for any other beers in Minnesota or outside the States, comment below, like and subscribe, and I will see you on the next one. Falling Knife Brewing, chef's kiss. Like I said, I've only ever had Falling Knife when they were collaborating with other breweries, but I'm hooked and I cannot wait to actually go to the brewery and experience well, everything they offer there in the tap room. And while I do that, I will probably be munching on a 7th Avenue pizza because 7th Avenue pizza is the best pizza on the planet, ladies and gentlemen. I'm never ordering pizza again. I don't need to because 7th Avenue pizza has my back and they have your back as well, ladies and gentlemen. Find them at Kowalski's Holiday Station, Hy-Vee, Lunds and Byerly, and more. Be sure to check the freezer's of your local grocery stores. And if they ain't selling 7th Avenue pizza, ask them why. And if you wanna know where you can find it in your neighborhood, close to you, be sure to hit up Matt or any of the team at 7th Avenue Pizza on Facebook, on Twitter, on any social media. They are so interactive with everybody. You hit them up, they will reply. They will let you know where to find them. They will let you know what events they will be at as well as we move into the spring and the summer. Matt knows how much I love their product and they're just amazing people as well. Amazing local company, amazing people, and just throw that domino shit in the garbage as it's fucking trash. It's absolute garbage. You never need to order pizza again now that you have 7th Avenue pizza in your life. So go get some today. 
Seventh Avenue Pizza, a proud partner of the Soda Pod. On the other side, my friend Seth Topol here to talk wild and NHL hockey here on the Soda Pod. Back with another hockey segment here on the Soda Pod. And as always, we got Seth Topol from Locked On Wild joining us riding shotgun. If you haven't already, go subscribe to Seth's YouTube channel, Locked On Wild. And if you just want to listen to the audio version of his podcast, that drop every single day. Ladies and gentlemen, you can find it wherever you get your podcast from just look on look up locked on wild look up seth topol you'll find it seth how are you happy easter how's it going buddy isha happy easter i am doing good had an opportunity for some elite food and uh, family time yesterday which during hockey season is a little too uh, few and far in between so that was uh that was fun uh vegas game was an entertaining one but uh as we'll talk about, uh, just kind of saw more of the same that we've seen all season. So good weekend and uh, the snow's starting to melt. Really not much more you can ask for at this point. Yeah, I was in shorts this morning. I went for a little run and it was it was funny that there was still snow around me because it's it's warm today. It's, it's supposed to get up into the 60s this week. Let's go. I might even actually go swimming. There Let's you go. go. <laughs> I am not brave enough to join on that front yet, but uh, I will not fault anybody who does want to. I love it. I love it. By the way, folks, Seth gave me a fucking heart attack as we started off this show. As he was like, as we we're talking, we we're talking through the outline, and I was like, okay, well, this this is what we're talking about for wild news, and we'll get into the wild news in the next segment. Seth's like, did you hear about the the? Did you hear about the signing? <laughs> yeah, one of my uh, one of my regulars, uh, Jay Homuth, tweeted out. Uh, that the Minnesota Wild have signed John Merrill to a uh, 2.5 million AAV extension for the next six years, full no trade. Um, and I responded to that with, "How dare you?" <laughs> I wouldn't have fall. I wouldn't have uh, fallen for it if I saw that because of like the no trade and probably the 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 term. But all Seth said to me was. Wait, you didn't hear John Merrill got extended? And I just looked. I'm like, what the fuck, bro? <laughs> Breaking news. Emotional no. damage. I would have lost. I would have lost what was left of my marbles had that actually happened. Bro, I'm I'm staying off Twitter all day. Like yeah. between the MMA memes and news, like uh, there's one promotion and credit to them. They're having fun with the, the audience. The This promotion in Singapore. I didn't even know they did April Fool's in Singapore, but they're like, oh, yeah, a new open weight fight with this like 125 er against like this 265 er They're like, let's see if little guys can actually use jujitsu on a, on a big heavyweight. And I was like, what are you doing? What is this freak show fight? And it's like April Fool's bitches. And I was like, OK, I'm no, I'm off Twitter. I'm off Twitter. It's not happening. I've had a good I've had an idea for and I've I've kind of I, I used to be very trolly on April Fool's Day, but I since I have started to, you know, gain more of a following from doing Locked on Wild, I just it's not a road I really want to go down, but I've had this idea. I just don't know how to execute it of doing an episode with Nordy. And asking him a ton of questions and just having somebody be in the mascot, like nodding and like moving their hands just with no audio and having me just like respond like a normal interview just with the mascot. But I don't know the best way to do that. So we got to get our hands on a Nordy costume. First of all, I think that's maybe if I just ask Nordy, maybe he'd I'm be sure, willing to do it. Yeah, you're tight with him now covering the games yeah. at the rink. Yeah, I might have to try that because that, that would be about. That'd be about the furthest into April Fools I would actually go. And I probably shouldn't have tipped my hand because that actually is kind of a brilliant idea. <laughs> oh, well. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, if, if it transpires, I think everyone will be stoked. This is more of a teaser than. Yeah, uh, it didn't happen. Anything. It didn't happen today, obviously. So yeah. we'll, uh, we'll just let everybody forget about it and do it next year. I'm more of like physical pranks versus online like trolling which again yeah some might argue that's not april fools because april fools it, it's almost like you want to troll them you want to convince them that's you know you, you want to fool them right but like I, you know my, my my grandpa who's passed away um him and i used to go at it when i was younger um you know the saran wrap on the toilet seat the upper deckers mostly just gross bathroom shit clogging the the shower side over like we, we were actually savage and i was like like 10 years old when at the peak of it um as he passed away when i was in high school but uh yeah him and i used to take april fools very seriously with the pranks um 
but yeah, I, I was more on that side. I was more of like, you know, the, the physical pranks, which again, doesn't, you can argue that it falls in line with like fooling someone, but it was just an excuse for us to, to mess with each other. Yeah. It's, it's just one of those things. I feel like with where Twitter has been heading, that it's just too easy because people can replicate verified accounts pretty easily. Um, it's just too easy to do it at this at this stage. So it's it's one of those things I, I enjoyed, but now I'm like, eh, I don't want to get I don't want to get taken for a ride by some fake news and yeah. then like throw that onto a show and have everybody be like, yeah, that's not right. Shout out to that PNG account, that Canucks fan. He's like the king of, you know, just changing his profile picture to, or profile to whatever it is. Especially to he, he used to <laughs> he used to impersonate uh, Francesco Aquilini, the owner of the Vancouver Canucks, because he's like active on Twitter, right? He's got someone who tweets out like "Good job, boys" and things like that. Mm. And so he was very good at Im- impersonating him and also Sportsnet for for big news. He still does that to this day. It doesn't matter if it's April Fools or not. And. Uh, Jeez. Now he's into the AI art. So guys, if you want to laugh, hockey Twitter, doesn't matter if you're from Minnesota Wild or Nation or not, man. Like PNG, he's or PMG uh and Snoop on uh on Twitter. They're they're great accounts. But anyways, let's uh let's turn the focus to hockey here. We're gonna start with some Minnesota Wild talk. A lot to unpack. Now, Seth and I usually don't like unpack a, a full game, and we won't go into too much detail, but there's Still a few things I want to hit on because Seth's already done that. So go check it out on Locked On Wild again. We've got a few NHL topics as well. Another Washington Capitals player hits the 1,000 game milestone. There's a certain fighter in the NHL right now who trains martial arts off the ice. So obviously you want to dive into that. Austin Matthews scored his 60th goal. So we'll talk about just some of the comparisons to past superstars in the National Hockey League that I see in him. And then, obviously, uh, we weren't able to talk about the passing of Chris Simon and uh, Konstantin Koltsov last week. So in the final segment, we'll just uh, pay a little respect to them, talk about just still the conversation around CTE and hockey fights. I'm sorry, I lied. We have one more segment after that, too. But uh, I don't know if it's old news now or not, but but, uh, let's just say I got a little heated on Twitter talking about this. So I want (laughs) to unpack it with someone else so I don't just yell at you guys here on YouTube and through the audio waves. But Seth, the Minnesota Wild, they kept our hopes alive, beating the San Jose Sharks 3-1. to one. You were right. They played more of a defensive. They played more of a, you know, can't make any mistakes. We have to win this game style of play. They weren't as loose as I thought they might be, despite looking confident in that game. But Saturday, the dreams were crushed. You were there. At the XL Energy Center covering the game while they played the Vegas, while they hosted the Vegas Golden Knights. Before we talk about the nitty gritty, uh, what was the atmosphere like in that one? Literally a must win game, the last must win game now in hindsight. Yeah, it was it was a good vibe. I mean, there were plenty, plenty of fans there. I think because it was an afternoon game, people had a little, you know, brunch mimosas or things along those lines to kind of get themselves ready to go. Uh, problem that we've seen periodically throughout this season. And, you know, we saw this in the postseason last year against Dallas at home, like game three, you gave them all the reasons to be rowdy and to really get into it. Like the fans are ready to go nuts. It's just, there weren't a ton of highlights in the way of scores or anything like that, because both teams played pretty tight, tried not to do too much to, uh, to give the opponent the upper hand. So you had a lot of fans who were kind of just waiting for a reason to go nuts and never really got one until Kaprizov's goal to to take the lead and place went nuts. Like it was, it was awesome. And Vegas unfortunately ties it up. And then you've got the confusion of, uh, (laughs) of pulling the goalie in OT and uh, that didn't work out as well. It is pretty indicative of where the wild are at, at this point that they had to, throw everything they had honestly you you absolutely had to win that game in regulation and you didn't so you kind of go into desperation mode and it's too little too late no yeah for sure um let's talk about some of the things that transpired in that game again if you guys want the full game rundown breakdown go check out uh seth's 
last YouTube video and podcast on Locked on Wild. Let's talk about the spear. Jack Eichel gets a five-minute penalty for spearing. Um, how how bad was it? Because I, I personally have seen worse. Now, I, I think 100% he was, you know, by the book, by the law, he was deserving of it. Um, a nice sell job from the Minnesota Wild as well, I will say. But, uh, you know, up in clo- up close in, in the rink, you know, you had a better... You had a better uh, line of vision. You all, you got to see it live. How bad was it compared to some of the others that we've seen this year in the National Hockey League? I don't think it warranted a game misconduct by any stretch. And it was interesting because the review took forever. And so my yeah, exactly. immediate my immediate thought process went to, okay, they're going to take this off the board. And they're trying to, they're trying to see... You know, when it happened, they're trying to make sure they have the clock right. And then all of a sudden they come out and they say it's a five minute major and a game misconduct. I'm like, OK, and bad timing for Vegas there because Eichel was he was having a, a night to uh, to start that game. And so he was obviously frustrated. Bruce Cassidy was beside I'm himself livid, yeah. at that call. And that's pretty indicative of kind of how the night went on both sides of the officiating, you had both coaches blowing their stacks on the officials. You had several players that did. And as we'll talk about here in a little bit, some things happens after basically at the end of the game that are going to have some carryover too. And so I, I, it was by definition, it was a spear. I just didn't think it met any of the criteria to go any further than a five minute. Like, yeah, it didn't look intentional. Didn't look like no. he like <laughs> medieval style charged that thing up and just <laughs> you well, know, gutted him like, there, right? It was it was a spear by the book, heat of the moment type of play. Was a little too aggressive, absolutely. So I think that's where the discussion, why the discussion took so long as well, is because there's probably like there was probably one official who was like, "Yep, take him out of the game." Every you know the whole nine yards, and the other one going, "Well, kind of like you and I are talking about now." Yeah, there's circumstances to it. I had maybe saw it, it transpire in detail a little bit more than you did. And then there was probably one in the middle who's like <laughs> taking, taking both sides of it until they finally uh, drew a conclusion there. There's definitely there one official being in the middle, not being in position to make in a, a particular call was definitely a theme of the night for both teams. Like it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just calls that the wild weren't getting. Like there were some calls that Vegas didn't get either. And so it just that that's just how it goes. Officiating, officiating is going to seem slanted, but at the at the end of the day, referees are human. I mean, how would you like to be the official who had the puck go off of his his ass and go into the net for uh, for a goal? Like, thankfully, right. that didn't happen uh, in this game. It's just it they're humans too. And they, they act on, they act on instinct. They act on impulse. And sometimes they are not in positions to make appropriate calls. Yeah. I know we've talked about this either. I forget what I can't keep track. It was either on your show or or one of the soda pod episodes a few weeks ago, but like, I, I would really love to see at least some sort of spokesperson representative from yeah the, uh, from the officials. And, you know, and I, and I, compared that to other sports as well, like judges in the, like the UFC, like, yeah, don't get the exact judge to come out. But when there's like a, a scorecard that's completely off from the other two, or, you know, there, there needs to be some sort of explanation to the fans of why that scorecard came out and to, you know, bring it back to hockey. Sometimes if there's calls that the fans do not understand that go kind of against, against the grain, against the norm, we need to know why, at least a little bit of a reason why, or an explanation of, you know, We've just haven't seen this detail in that play. And by the book, you know, it's just not, we just don't see that often, for example, you know, so, something along those lines where they can yeah. give us a little bit of clarity. So I totally agree with everything you said there. They're human. We can't, we can't like just deem them monsters when it doesn't go, when, when things don't go right for our team and when there is potentially a bad call, but we, I would love some accountability from some sort of spokesperson or, or represent, uh, representative representative from, uh, whether it's their union or whatever, you know, maybe there's just a few different spokespersons so that so that one doesn't just get dogged on the whole time. Just go the route of the NFL. And I think the NBA has them too, is just have a pool reporter 
yeah. that is able to answer questions based on particular things. I, I think the NFL, it's one of the officials or it's somebody that represents the officials themselves, but they have media availability after games to talk through calls. That'd be easy. That would be an easy step for the NHL to take. And I think part of it too is with as much reliance as we have continued to have on replay, I think officials feel like they're in a no win situation on some types of plays is where, well, if I call this this way, they're going to review it and it's going to get overturned. So it doesn't matter if I call it one way or the other. Um, It's, it's, it's not you shouldn't have that mindset system. though. You should call it, you know, yeah. how you see it in real time. And like you said, there's the human element element of it. It's a fast paced game. If upon replay, it's different. You're not going to lose your job over it. Like don't, don't, I, I, I hate when refs have that retali- not retaliatory mindset, but like the mindset of like, okay, we have to keep the game even, or I have to call this a certain way because if it gets reviewed, like th- there's an extra yeah. voice in their head. There's an extra layer there that could be, you know, blinding them. That could be a blinder of what's actually happening in real time. Now, again, I've I've never ref a hockey game, but uh, I I do have friends who ref. I even have a friend who um who refs in the WHL, and you know I've I've just I, I always ask them questions because I'm fascinated about by it, and you know that's just one thing that um, my friend in the dub always says. He's like I I call it how I see it in game, and anything that happens after that, you know, that's review. That that's that's part of the game here today. Yeah, it's I, I don't know it's. It's something that's always been an issue. It just seems like year in, year out, uh, it just it seems like it continues to be more and more of a problem. Yeah, and the NHL is just not transparent like the other big leagues. And Gary yep. Bettman wants to protect his zebras. Protect a lot of things. Yes. <laughs> um, Murat looked incredible in that last game, and... There might be some wild fans, and um, when I turn it over to you here in a sec, you can even let me know if there's like a, a small portion of your fan base who is looking at it this way. But one assist, seven games. There, uh, I, I feel like there's a portion of the fan base who are expecting more from Murat right now, who are like, okay, well, you guys said he was this killer prospect. Where's the offense? Where are the points? What is he actually doing to help his team? Score sheet or not, points on the board or not, you can see the impact that this guy is making for his team when he gets minutes. Now, finally, if I'm not mistaken, he played the most minutes in this game than any other game thus far, had a little bit of an elevated role against the Vegas Golden Knights, and some of the plays that he made, man, were absolutely incredible. Like, him dancing coast to coast was unbelievable i i can't even how many guys did, I, I have it up right here i can't show you guys because of uh youtube and i don't have the audio from it but he he gets the puck in his own zone rips through one of the vegas wingers two guys are on him beautiful play where he turns to his right carves back left goes behind the net and then passes down the wing to the blue line man like that is why he is so valuable now He's just not getting the points after due to it. What do you want to call it? Puck luck or whatever. But like, imagine the defenseman took a shot through the lane there and it was, it was bounced, it bounced in or it was a nice clean shot in. Imagine if he wanted to do spinorama, you know, next to the goalie, you know, there were, there were opportunities for, for him to score. And there was a huge one there, him hitting the post also in the game. I mean, I see it as more just bad puck luck in regards to the reason why he doesn't have more points, both on the assist side and scoring. But you cannot deny that this guy is doing incredible things out there. Still so new to this team. Still so new to this league. Still so new to the North American game. What say you, Seth? Because you had the honor, privilege, and luck to be able to watch this guy live. And I imagine you were just freaking out during that play, much like I was. I was. And I actually took it even a step further and was like, okay, anytime that line is on the ice, I'm just going to watch Murat and see what he is doing on a uh, shift by shift basis. Um, He, I I thought it was one of his better games of the season. And it came against the Vegas golden Knights who are a pretty stingy defensive team themselves. Um, You talked about the hitting the post. He had one in which the wild were able to uh, get a turnover 
on the uh, on, along the boards, and he kind of broke free with the puck towards the net, tried to go between the legs and uh, between the legs backhand even, and got it through Logan Thompson's five hole. It just hit and kicked to the left. Uh, so he had that play. He had a, just a gorgeous shot as the Wilds created another turnover, and it was Marcus Johansson that was able to get him the puck in the midst of a, a tangle at the the top of the Golden Knight zone. He ra- uh, rifled the puck to the far side of the uh, of the zone. Marat had nobody anywhere around him. And so he takes the opportunity to step up a little bit and he lasers a shot on net that just goes a little too high. Like you're starting to see some of that confidence yep. offensively, but I think something that we need to keep in mind too is that this was always going to be kind of what Murat was. Is he was going to be able he was going to be somebody that came in and was able to help immediately defensively. Like he and I just I loved watching him do his thing when there were battles along the boards. If he wasn't directly involved, he just immediately went to the front of the net to keep that area clean. It's like those defensive instincts are there and they're very solid. He's going to be able to add offensively going forward. And so to see him be confident enough in what he's doing to uh, get a couple shots on net, um, I, I thought it was fantastic, and John Hines definitely agreed because in the final couple of minutes of that game, who was centering Ryan Hartman and Matt Zuccarello? Amazing. It was Murat Nadinov. and this is a situation where it's not like Marco Rossi was playing poorly. I thought Marco had a great game, too. It's just we've seen John Hines do this a couple of times where he just likes to kind of feel the and try to ride the vibes during games and who i he, trust more right now based on what they're doing yeah to, to close this out like in that situation that marat was deserving of getting that time so it was it was more him getting promoted than it was rossi getting demoted it's yep. like let's just give him a shot here and see what he can do fuck his skating is so smooth it's not like it's not he doesn't have blitzing speed. It's not like he, he takes two strides and he's off, but it's so smooth, man. And I imagine in you know in real life it's a lot faster than than even what we see on TV. And I'm so excited to be at the game and to hang out with Seth next weekend or this weekend, I should say, uh, as I'll be there. And I'm just so excited to to see him mostly skate than well, obviously play, but just to see how how fast he actually is in yeah. real life. Like I'm a like. In regards to hockey, there's two things I'm I'm obsessed with, and this is why defensemen are like they're, they're my favorite. It's my favorite position, uh, defense in, in hockey, is because I'm obsessed with obviously fighting, but skating, and that's why you know whether he was on whether he was with the Vancouver Canucks or not, that's why I'm obsessed with Quinn Hughes because I I didn't even watch much college hockey in Canada because it's just harder to find. You better believe I watched almost every single Michigan game for the for his uh, couple years that he was there because I was just blown away that this guy was like the second coming of Dennis Savard. So when I see some of the things that, you know, like Zim Boyum did, we talked about him for Denver, which by the way, shout out to Denver, uh, had, a, had some good games over the week. Um, mm. I, I was, I'm, I'm obsessed with him now because of his skating. And upon watching more of Marat, even though he's not as quick as some of the two guys, as those two guys that I mentioned there and, you know, nowhere near the, the skater of Dennis Savard, because no one is, let's be perfectly honest. Um, it's still very intriguing to me. And that, that play in Vegas really solidified. Okay. This guy's got some moves, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He like they, he's done nothing. He's done nothing in his short time with the team to suggest anything else other than he is in the lineup next year. Day one. Like, Oh, hundred percent. He's done nothing. He has done nothing to suggest that he's not capable of handling it. And I could see is going to be getting him any literally anybody else on that line there it is there it is and and, sorry to cut you off there what what i was gonna say is i could see him even with like poor offensive puck luck still being a 30 to 35 points guy Mm -hmm. and with some puck luck with some with the cast around him easily 40 maybe even you know 45 you know that 50 range yeah he's i mean and he he seems like somebody that is very capable of and willing to learn and put the time in like if you follow him on instagram he 
has a bunch of stuff that he posts doing just like workouts. Like he seems very inclined to pick up on things. And so, you know, we need to just, the wild just need to compensate Jewel Erickson Eck a little more to basically just run like an off season program for all of these centers, get Matt Boldy in there, like just get all these young kids in the Erickson Eck program and uh, just let them all, let them all blossom at the same time. It's so funny you mentioned that because uh, my last comment on this was going to be, you know, I, I hope he's training with Eck in the off season. <laughs> And, and get them all like said, in I hope the everyone's doing deadlifts with him in the off season. Yeah, get them all in the program, get them started and just prosper. We'll have multiple Mr. September's. It'll be That'd great. Be fine fine by me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um a couple more things on this topic here. Seth, do you believe that and this kind of goes back to the referee talk a little bit, but do you think Vegas was getting away with some of their high sticks? because of what happened with Eichel and that maybe the refs kind of took their foot off the gas a little bit and we're like, okay, we already, we already, uh, get, we, we already penalized them. We already took their arguably one of their best players, if not their best player out of the game, five minutes. Yeah. It was by the book, but the game within the game. And we talked about evening things out, which I do not like in regards to NHL hockey. And I feel like it happens in NHL hockey more than any other league, junior, you know, Euro, European leagues, IHF, regardless. Um, do you think that this was simply them just missing it? Or do you think there was a little bit of, you know, turning the blind eye to even things out? Cause there were two really bad ones. Yeah, there were the Hartman one at the end was, it was pretty blatant. Like, I, I don't know how that one was missed. Um, Jewel Erickson Eck was tripped pretty, uh, pretty egregiously at one point he in the game pissed. too. Yeah, he was, he was insane. I'm surprised he didn't bad. fight. <laughs> and Honestly, like the Hartman goalie uh, goaltender interference, like how how can you say that that wasn't a push? Like it very clearly was. I know I was going back and forth with people saying like, well, you know, what's he what's he doing getting that close and not allowing himself the opportunity to get out of the area? It's like he was pushed. Like yeah. you don't have to go any further down that road other than to just say what ended up actually happening. And so I, I think I go the route of, I'm not naive enough to suggest that that kind of stuff doesn't happen, but I think in this instance, I think it was just some missed. I think it was just some stuff that got missed. Just an off night for the officials. Yeah. Like there, there was no need. And with it being an ESPN game, a lot of people, mentioning that uh, that espn was laying it on thick for vegas like nah, that, there's that, no need to do any of that there's no need to do any of that well we got to help the defending champs get to the postseason like they're already in at this point like people you don't are need saying to the same thing out. about boston uh boston university yeah or sorry we, boston college they're saying the same thing oh we want boston college in there oh we we you know we <laughs> They didn't ESPN didn't want uh, Quinnipiac. Oh, you know, they, they wanted the Wolverines. That that's why. It's like, no, did you guys not watch the games yeah. over the weekend? Did you not watch the NCAA? The better teams won. Plain like, and what's... simple. There were no egregious calls, even close to what we saw in the Minnesota Wild game against Vegas. So, like, I've been seeing that, Seth, you know, coming from the college hockey and the NHL um from Minnesota Wild fans this last weekend. And I get it, you know, grief. It uh, it trans it transpires in very you know multiple forms and then some of it is anger some of it you know you gotta blame someone so I get it but yeah I don't think there's any foul play there I don't think there's any collusion in regards to ESPN being involved at all ESPN doesn't give a shit about the National Hockey League dude yeah they don't give a shit about hockey let's be perfectly honest like just just look at what they put into the broadcast <laughs> oh it's yeah. Just it's, Shut up, it's Bucci like, Gross, man. <gasps> Anyways. Like third or fourth. <laughs> it's like fourth or fifth on the totem pole. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, last but not least, bad luck continues. Um, do you have an update on Chisholm as he took a nasty shot to the face? Yeah, he got one in the ear hole um on a deflected shot. It looked pretty bad. Um, if I recall correctly, I believe he came back into the game. So okay. I am hoping that that is a good sign that he's not going to have any uh, any issues with that going forward. But also put yourself in his shoes. I could think of nothing that would feel worse 
And I have had at one point in my life, I got hit in the ear with a pretty good sized rock. Um, there is no greater discomfort than because you think about everything that is housed inside your ear and to get hit with a large object. There's nothing that's worse. Like, well, there's like hardly any way for the blood to be distributed. So it just explodes. Yeah. <laughs> right. And once like, the cartilage is broken, it doesn't repair. Right. Um, and yeah. so I did, I did know he came back into the game, but I didn't know if like, he had to get any. I don't even know if can you really get stitches on your ear if there's like if they glue the cartilage together. Like I just didn't know. If, again, Ugh. you're closer to the team than I am. I just didn't know if you yeah. had any updates on him. But it was good to see him back out. There. I mean, hockey players are fucking. You know, they're they're, they're warriors. Insane. They'll they'll take pus, pucks to the face, get stitched up, come back out. Chara freaking played playoff series with his freaking mouth sewn together, which was nuts. Him drinking freaking his plant based protein shakes through like you know Ugh. a little gap between his teeth. To stay uh, hydrated and fed. I mean, uh, hockey players are a different breed, man. But I, I, I bring that up because there was a fight over the weekend on a feeder league to the UFC called uh, Legacy Fighting Alliance, which, by the way, Mystic Lake on Friday. They will be at Mystic Lake Casino LFA. An awesome show. A lot of Minnesota locals, uh, some former gopher wrestlers competing there. And our boy Alvin Guzzi Hines from Duluth. I interviewed him a couple months ago. Awesome guy to root for. Doesn't even watch the sport. Just loves to fight. He like he's like yeah I maybe watched Chuck Liddell a couple times when I was a kid but I don't I don't follow the sport man I just like I sign the contract and I go and fight. He'll be representing Duluth in Minnesota this weekend as well and he's on the main card. So big shout out to Alvin Guzzi Hines for those who uh, follow fighting. But back to what I was gonna say in the main event of their their fight card Legacy Fighting Alliance 180 this last weekend there was an absolute war in the main event. The better fighter won but he just couldn't knock out his opponent who was just just had an iron chin, but the guy who was winning in the third, he lost the third round because he was a bloody mess. Cause his poor cauliflower ear fucking Ooh. popped dude. Oh. And it was just all over the face of his opponent. It was like, Oh my God. It was insane. So at, that was Friday night. Then watching Chisholm take it. I was like, what is going on with these athletes ears this weekend, man? I've seen way too much of this. <laughs> We got to protect the ears at all costs. Um, oh my no, God. I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything. Um, and you know, this is about the time that that practice and or morning skate has already taken place. So I'm, I'm going to hope that that just means that he was in some discomfort, but yeah. uh, that nothing structurally was damaged. That's good. That's good. He might he protect may have a little... the ears at all costs he might have a little uh his ear might stick out a little bit now moving forward but i'm sure i'm sure his girl still loves him i'm sure his wife still loves him yeah you can love love can conquer a lot of things especially a mangled puck ear <laughs> i mean yeah there's there's some former gopher wrestlers who have mangled ears and you know they're doing pretty well for themselves in that department let's just say that all right that kind of wraps up everything i had for the minnesota wild um is there anything that that I missed here is anything that you want to cover going into next week? Um, no, at this point, we're pretty much just waiting for the official mathematic elimination, which I would imagine will probably come this week. I, I don't know. I don't know what the magic number is at, but the wild were basically going to have to go with 10 games left. They were basically going to have to run the table. Yeah. And hope that Vegas went like three and six. And now you're not even you're not even chasing Vegas. You're chasing Los Angeles and they play Anaheim twice. And I think Chicago twice in these final eight games or whatever it is. So, well, you know, you want know then I know it's not official yet, but it's official here on the soda pod. It's fucking time, Seth. We're going to be doing this weekly for the rest <laughs> for the rest of the season. Here we go. Well, thank God Macklin Celebrini didn't go to uh, to Chicago this time. Anaheim could use him. Sad. Well, let's hope we have better luck next week, Seth. For those listening, we'll we just again. hit the Tankathon simulator, and the Minnesota Wild are at 15th. Anaheim Ducks move up two spots, number one, San Jose Sharks, number two, and the fucking Blackhawks, number three. Oh my god! I was hoping to end this segment on a on a fun note. I was like, "What? Watch him even get to like eight or something. Then we can celebrate a bit." But oh my goodness! All right. Well, 
pain continues, Seth. The pain continues. Um, <laughs> let's move on to some NHL news now. Actually, sorry. Oh, I, I can't believe I... This is on me. This is on me. As I'm closing tabs here of my notes. Um, and this just came out uh, today, actually. But uh, Ryan Hartman is going to be facing... Um, or no, no, he hasn't been, he's not going to be facing a suspension yet, but he's going to be meeting with the NHL player safety due to him throwing a stick in the direction of the ref. And, and this is why I was off my radar towards the end of this. Cause I was asking you before the show, I, do you have the video? I can't find it anywhere. And says like, no man, it's, it's been deleted from the internet. Billy Garen doesn't want any of that smoke anywhere. It's the Zapruder film. It just does not like it, it does not exist. I, I tried looking for probably two hours last night, and I tried looking again today. I was texting Z. He couldn't find it. You know, he's he's our resident, you know, wild clips guy on Twitter. But, uh, I mean, look, if we're, we talked about earlier in the segment, if we're going to go buy the book, he's probably going to get assessed. He's probably going to yeah. get suspended. 40.4 um, of the NHL Department of Player Safety rules? Uh, automatic suspension category three any player who by his action physically uh, demeans an official or physically threatens an official by but not limited to throwing a stick bold highlight <laughs> italic yeah. or any other piece of equipment or object at or in general direction of official shooting the puck at or in general direction of official spitting or in general direction of official or who deliberately applies physical force to an official solely for the purpose of getting free of such an official during immediately following an altercation shall be suspended for not less than three games, dude. Yeah, it's certainly looking it's certainly looking that way. I think the only thing that could maybe persuade Department of Player Safety to be lesser is how egregious the no call was. But even that, like, react any number of other ways yeah. to that happening at the end of the game. Like, this would be no different if... This would be no different if you're out on the golf course at like a PGA Tour event and your ball hits like hits a spectator and goes out of bounds or something and the officials are like right there and they don't see it and you throw a club at them like you're going to get hit with the book regardless yeah. or if you like if you're playing an NBA game and an official makes a call that you don't necessarily like and you throw the basketball at them like there, there is a way to dispute a call or be upset with a no call, but there's a line that there's a line that you can't cross. And bottom line is that uh, Hartman did, and so now he will have to uh, he will have to pay for it. And the other part of this too, repeat offender. Yeah, yeah. So we're most like I, I don't think the. I don't think he gets a break on this one. I think it's three games. Yeah. I think it's three games. Like we'll I said, going out. by the book. Going by the book, and it's literally in there. If you throw a stick in the direction of official, no less than three games. And that's literally what he did, allegedly, because I haven't seen the footage again. Yeah. If somebody <laughs> finds a video, please send it our way because I just I I would like to see it. Yes. I'd like to see what it was. Yes. Um, but anyways, okay. Now, now we'll turn the page from wild news. I, I, I would be remiss if we didn't mention that since it was uh, that's like the big news uh, here today. And um, sorry again, guys, that we're coming out a day late on the soda pod. We took Easter Sunday off. Seth and I were both busy, and um, yeah, and we had some time here today, both of us off work. So we decided to just link up and record this Monday. Um, you guys are still getting it today, just a little bit later. Okay. Moving on to some NHL news. Another Washington Capitol hits the 1,000th game milestone. That is right. John Carlson is the 128th defenseman in the National Hockey League to reach 1,000 games. He's the 41st mo or he is a player with the 41st most minutes by any other player in the National Hockey League since the league started to track minutes. Uh, 24,000 in season. And an additional three thousand in the playoffs, dude. This cat he, has played a lot of hockey, a lot of hockey, and having been able to spend a good majority of that with Alex Ovechkin's got to be pretty cool too. 
Absolutely, dude. And he's the 80th player in NHL history to hit 1,000 games dressed with one team, which I thought was just really cool as well to see that like loyalty to see that the uh, the team you know values you that much and it's funny because when john carlson uh kind of developed and came onto the scene him and carl alsner were like such a good pairing and and carl alsner played more of the, you know the defensive style game john carlson was more the offensive game but but there was a there was a time where people actually valued carl alsner more than carlson until he freaking popped a few years ago, man. Because he was always a 30 to 40 uh, point player. And then in, you know, 17, 18 onward, he's just been an absolute beast. So 34 years old. Oh, man, it's crazy because I still, there's still a tiny part of me who's like, oh, yeah, John Carlson, he's still pretty young for this team. No, man, the Capitals are aging. It's proof in the pudding here with a thousand games in the National Hockey League, 668 points as a defenseman, 149 goals, and 73 points in the playoffs in 123 games. That cannot be overlooked, man. That is incredible. Um, here's a here's an interesting wild way to spin this. How would you feel if Brock Faber went on that similar trajectory with his career? Oh, I I would not be upset about that we'd at take, all we'd take that we would take him being that type of a guy because Carlson, he's already better for the record he's already better come like not better than maybe john carlson is now you know what i mean but like yeah. as far as john carlson's early i mean there's an argument that he could be better than him right now I, i'm willing to entertain that based on his defensive abilities but yeah coming into the national hockey he's already better than what carlson was in his first season yeah if he can develop into that sort of a like double digit goal guy with upside to like 15 goals as a defenseman. He's going to just be like going to be just outrageous. No, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited for the Brock Faber era. Now it's, yeah. it's, it's going to be amazing. Call He's everything we winner. wanted in Dumba and more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Maybe not the 30 goals that Dumba, you know, promised us. And then it never happened, but I want to blame Kachuk for that. I want to blame Kachuk. Yeah, for that. I think we all will. All right. Um, speaking of Brock Faber, speaking of the Calder race, which, man, we annoyed some people on YouTube last week for our clickbait, quote unquote. I was like, I, I told the, I usually don't mess with the comments. I leave that to Hoppy. But that one, I was like, bro, how can it be clickbait if it's true? And the title was Faber is better than Bedard. <laughs> and let's just say that there were some Blackhawk fans who weren't really happy with that. But uh, I think we made a solid argument for him. Now I'm about to make an argument for another cat. If Brock Faber does not, if Brock Faber does not win the Calder, then there's only one other person. There's only one other deserving person, and that is <laughs> the man, the myth, the legend, Matthew Rempe, Seth. Oh my God, this kid is just such a menace. And I know we've gone like a few weeks, and I haven't even talked about him, which a lot of you know. <laughs> All of our friends in our in our wild group chat, everyone who knows that I'm obsessed with fighting is like, have you not brought up this kid on the podcast yet? Well, I am now. I am now, bro. If if Faber's not going to win the Calder, this this is the kid that should. He's already taken out every heavyweight in the National Hockey League. He's fought he's fought Matt Martin. He's fought Delorier. He's fought Revo. I mean, like, who else is there for this guy to fight to show that, like, I'm the new big dog in town, both literally and figuratively. He was a six-round pick for the Rangers, played for the Seattle Thunderbirds, uh, also played a little bit in the AJHL. He's a, he's a Calgary kid. Um, played two pretty much full seasons with the Hartford Wolfpack, and then, uh, you know, was called up this year, 13 games. Upon coming into the league he fought like crazy man he was fighting yeah. pretty much every single night you know what was it like five fights in three games at one point and taking on the big dogs um he did receive a suspension and upon coming back for suspension hasn't gotten a lot of minutes hasn't even been iced as much and he's uh i think he was just scratched in his last game as well which you know it, i'm okay with you know the with the coaching staff, you know, like, okay, we know what you bring. We will now use you accordingly, right? We'll use you as a piece yeah. for our team. But I think he's there to stay, man. I think he's there to stay. I think, like, if there's a stretch where the Rangers are like, okay, like, maybe maybe we don't use you in every playoff game, that's fine. But next season, I mean, I don't think they send him back down. I, I think he stays with the team. Well, and no better way to endear yourself to your teammates than by fighting anything that moves in his uh, short span in the NHL so far. And 
that brings, you know, that, that kind of stuff. I know we roll our eyes at it, but there is a place for it when it gets to be playoff time is that physicality. Cause the goons come out like the goons are going to go. You've got Goon guys. Mentality comes out. I think more than yeah. just like the goons, right? You see guys who never thought um, would play that style or whose wires never crossed all season. And suddenly like they're public enemy. Number one. You got guys that will try to take liberties at uh, opposing players. I mean, the Wild saw a great example of that last postseason against the Dallas Stars. Um, it is a thing. It's part of playoff hockey is is being physical and trying to just trying to get in the head of your opponent and beat them into submission. And so having a guy that you can throw out there that will beat the brakes off of anybody um, is is somebody that I, I'm sure the uh, the Rangers players, they I'm sure they have a ton of respect for him not having any fear coming in as a as a rookie. Yeah, and the guy's like, it's tongue-in-cheek. He ain't, he's not even close to the Calder. He's got fucking yeah. two points in 13 games, but 54 penalty minutes? Mm, that tickles my fancy, Seth. And you guys know how much of a fight fan I am, so I was just so wounding over the fact of learning that he actually trains martial arts, which I'm, I'm not surprised, but I'm I'm excited he trains in the martial art that I am the fan of the most, which is Muay Thai. Muay Thai is the eight limb martial art where you can, it, it's also known as Thai kickboxing because in contrast to kickboxing, you can clinch in Muay Thai and use your elbows and knees in the clinch. And in kickboxing, you usually have bigger gloves. Now, historically Thai boxing you'd have like the same eight ounce gloves but now there's promotions out in Singapore who are putting like uh MMA gloves like the four ounce gloves on these guys which just increased like the knockouts and man every Friday morning uh 7 30 no 8 30 eastern um this one promotion called one championship for free on YouTube um puts on shows at this at the Lupini Boxing Stadium, which is like the Madison Square Garden of Thailand, usually like 11 or 12 Muay Thai fights. And I'm not even kidding. Like 80% of them are like vicious knockouts. Like they're, they're incredible fights and they're all like little, little Thai guys and gals just going at it. So upon learning that Matt Rempar actually trains Muay Thai in Calgary, primarily in the off season, just shows that like, he's not just a goon. He has a martial arts mentality as well, because that, that kind of stuff just gets instilled in you when you train in the arts. And I learned this actually because he was uh, um, interviewed by a Rangers media outlet. And here's a small clip of that. In, yeah, I do Muay Thai. Do you really? Yeah, me and my buddy, we started last summer We do last summer with a, with a guy up in Calgary, and we do it. We, I love it. I boxing lessons? I do boxing as well and stuff, and just, I think it's, I think it's really cool. I just want to, obviously, I want to learn. I'm 21. I've got a lot, a lot to work on with all this stuff, but it's, I think it's, it's, I think it's sweet. I want to learn. I want to learn more for sure. Now, obviously, his size helps because he's an absolute, like, beast. I mean, most of the best fighters in the, in the national hockey league do some sort of some sort of training outside of just hockey skills. Uh, their dry land usually consists of, you know, mostly boxing as I know Reeves has done some boxing. Hell, even Evander Kane, him coming from a boxing family. Um, I, I believe his uncle and his dad actually fought professionally. He has some cousins who are, who are boxers. He did a lot of boxing in the off season as well earlier in his career and especially when he was beating guys up in the whl but then you guys you then you got have guys like old school scott parker who i don't know if you guys have seen um any of the documentaries in regards to you know fighters in in the national hockey league but he's told this story many times that in the offseason he used to wrap chains around his knuckles and go and punch trees because he figured if i can break a tree if I can, you know, put a dent into a tree with chains on my knuckles that like harden them up, he's like, I can punch through a helmet with ease. Jeez. <laughs> Which I mean, that's a little fucked up. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like condoning that today. But it's just, I, I would rather see Matt Rempart be training in a martial art in Muay Thai. But man, these fighters have like a crazy mentality outside of, uh, outside of the rink, and he clearly knows what his role is now moving forward. Well, and like you have to have mentally just the alpha mentality. Oh, in yeah. order to be able to get in order to be able to be successful in any sort of uh, fight scenario is you you can't like you can't sit back and wait for your opponent to falter like you just got to go. You just got to go on the aggression like you just got to go on the attack. 
Or you have to be a little cunning. As I don't know if you heard the story. Do you hear what Terry Ryan did in his first uh, run in the B- in the BCHL back in the day? Mm-mm. So he was a a sixteen year old, and it was the former BC Junior Hockey League, now just the BCHL. Um, he was brought over there from the east coast of Canada, and you know he would fight as a as a young guy as well. And to prove to the boys that he a belonged on the team because he was he was the youngster, the the star coming from out east, you know. And, and, you know, the, with egos involved in hockey, especially at that age, you know, you want to show your teammates that I belong and you want to show the league that I belong as well. And he said what he did. I don't know if it was his first game or second game. In one of his one of his first games anyways, where he knew I had to go out there and, and make a statement, not just with my skills, because he ripped up that league as far as points and, and offense uh, went. But I got to show them that I'm also tough as well. So what he did is he would he. There's a few things here, but this is he's 16 years old, by the way. I got to got to hammer that out. He would uh, with a razor, he carved slits into his helmet because he wanted if if he wanted his opponent to cut his hand if he if he hit it. You know, when you cut slits into the, the plastic helmet, you know, there's it's, it's just easier to scrape up, you know, skin when you're hitting that. Um, and he said that they went to Denny's for breakfast in the morning or the night before, and he took a bunch of the hot sauce packets. And and what he did was he put hot sauce all like around that area so that if the guy did cut his hands, the hot sauce would seep into the cuts and he'd be like, what the fuck is going on here? And furthermore, he kept a, cu- a couple of them in his uh, <laughs> in his freaking uh, I forget what um, I forget what uh, gear he was wearing. But anyways, he kept it stored in his gear that when he went out there, he literally crushed it in his hands, would face wash the guy's eyes, put hot sauce in the guy's eyes, and then start swinging. So like, there's like two parts to that. Jeez. So you have to also be a little, a little fucked in the head and a little cunning to be able to uh, be a little on the <laughs> crazy side. Um, I believe that was one of the many stories he told on Chicklets, and I probably butchered it because you know Terry Terry's version is like half an hour, but the guy's more verbose than me yeah man i don't know i'm just i'm just obsessed with muay thai personally it's it's one of the most beautiful martial arts out there and it's it's incredibly violent i would say still that like as far as being injured in a sport in in and injured in a, in a sport that allows fighting i mean hockey's a lot less than that of muay thai a lot less than that of mma just because the fights in hockey aren't that long you're taking a few blows to the head Muay Thai, I would argue that guys' knees and bodies are getting pieced up more because you can attack the body, you can attack the leg. And in MMA, it's like your whole body will get hurt because you're wrestling. You know, you may, you might hurt yourself, you know, with a submission and things like that. But boxing is still the most dangerous sport of of, of all because yeah, it's just nonstop blows uh, to the head and. This isn't like the the best segue, but I feel like it's appropriate here, and, and we want to talk talk about it. As um, there were two recent deaths in the hockey world, and I mean, as someone who loves fighting the sport in general, as someone who loves fighting in hockey, I'm always kind of in the middle of this argument, Seth. Which is why I didn't want to talk about it by myself. I wanted to talk about it with you, and and you know, especially you, but with someone else in in general on the podcast here, because um, former NHL, two former NHL players, Chris Simon and Konstantin Koltsov, uh, passed away w- within the last few weeks. And already the crowd, the, the anti-fighting crowd, are jumping on this to push the narrative that fighting shouldn't be allowed in hockey. Now, I know Chris Simon, he was an enforcer. He was a fighter through and through. Koltsov wasn't. This game is so violent. This game is so brutal, even if you're not fighting. Like, I, I still personally believe and I've looked up some data on this as well. I, I don't think it's enough to just say yes or no because this isn't a black and white you know, situation, conversation here. But when you're taking hits in open ice or even against the boards from guys who are now skating, you know, I'm going to throw the kilometers out here, but like up, up to 40 kilometers an hour, that's going to rattle your brain just as much as taking a few shots, right? And yeah. obviously there's that inherent risk of, you know, your head being hit on the ice after a fight or getting knocked out and getting, you know, and, and falling on the I get that. And, and and that's hard to watch, and and I don't even like watching that. Even though there's there's a, there's obviously a risk to that in fighting. I, I love Chris Simon, man. And what's sad about it is there's various articles right now coming out on you know one particular political side of the scale, who in their articles have said there is no proof, there is no data, there is nothing that said that Chris Simon was suffering from CTE yet. 
they're going to jump on that narrative and push that to ban fighting now instead of remembering, you know, what he did and everything like that. And I know we're kind of doing the same here, but I just want to unravel that that key point, that key point is what is, is what kind of pisses me off, especially when Koltsov was thrown in to that conversation as well, where he was never a fighter. He was never a bruiser. He was more of a skilled fast skating player who only played a handful of games with the Pittsburgh Penguins in the National Hockey League, but he was suffering depression. He was suffering fighting his own demons, and there wasn't really signs that he was struggling with much out uh, in the KHL. He was actually an assistant coach for one of the teams there where Chris Simon was dealing with some other stuff, and if you guys want to dive into that. His family has been very vocal about it. But overall, with this conversation, especially it being very near and dear to us in Minnesota with the passing of Derek Bugard, what are your thoughts on just people pushing this, jumping on this narrative and pushing that, especially when there's no data, there's no proof that someone like Chris Simon was suffering with that yet anyways? Well, we'll see if, you know, his family allows um, you know, medical to, to do some tests on his brain moving forward. But like, where do you stand on this? Well, it's it's something that the human brain does even subconsciously is you just we work to connect dots with situations that we don't have all the the uh, information about is you just you know, it's can it, it would be it would make sense for a to go to B. And so let's just let's just make sure that it goes that way. And it's just it's one of those things where and this is something I struggle with as um, as a reporter too, like as somebody that actually, you know, covers the team in a uh, large capacity is and, and even just in my my general day to day with news stories, because there are obviously news stories that come out that are way more personal, deal with tragedy and impact people Um in not so great ways sometimes mm -hmm. and it just i always go back to i would rather be right than first and it just it seems like we are going way too far the other way to where people are like i gotta be first i gotta be the first one to have the news i gotta be the first one to to get this out there i gotta be the first one to get on this train of thought, as opposed to simply just allowing for the actual info to come out and then reacting to it accordingly. Like that's the route we should all be going down. And instead it seems like we're going further and further down to where people are now trying to preemptively like connect one thing to another. It's uh, that's just the nature of kind of where we have gotten with, with technology, with, with internet, with all that is it's just, it's too accessible to where now we're trying to go Tom Cruise and minority report to try to uh, predict what's coming as opposed to just simply reacting to what is happening. Yeah, no. Well, well said, man. Well said. And just to piggyback off that, like there's a, a news outlet called the daily mail who had to rewrite the article because they were one of the first ones out there with a blog and they 100% said, yep, there's proof that he had CTE. They've already done tests or whatever. And that's just, frankly not true and gary bettman even commented on it and i know he's one who always protects fighting and hawking again wherever you guys stand on that you may like that about gary bettman you may not like that about gary bettman but at the end of the day he did say until uh until we get the information from medical professionals i'm not going to entertain that topic we're here to support the families it's a tragic loss and and he kind of left it at that. Now Koltsov, that that one that one hit me hard as well, man, because he was you know, it was one of those cases where he did a good job of hiding it. He did a good job of hiding that he was fighting some demons. Both these hockey players, they, they each took their life, ladies and gentlemen, and, and that's again why the why Seth said you know we're gonna try to people are gonna try to connect the dots here. And um, yeah, he was you know found dead by it. You know, apparent suicide, no foul play was suspected. He was serving as an assistant coach for Salavat uh, Uolev the past two seasons, and he was also an assistant coach for the Belarusian men's national team. The national team coach, Dmitry Baskov, called his death an irreparable loss and that he was, quite frankly, devastated. He said, Konstantin was one of the undisputable leaders of our team, a talented progressive coach, a bright player. 
He was an example of sturdiness, hard work, dedication, and an idol for many, many Belarusian hockey players and his colleagues. It's hard. It's unfair when people leave this earth that early. Man, that that just tugs on my heartstrings there. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, and as we wrap up this segment, I I and then talk about these two guys. Do want to remember them in you know a, a positive light and and what they contributed to the sport and as being a, a Belarusian player. I mean, Belarus isn't necessarily known to be the best hockey nation out there, but I mean, we see their I mean, other than them being banned right now due to political reasons. I mean, we see them stamp their ticket into the World Junior Championship. We've seen them in the Olympics. We've seen many NHL players come through the Belarusian system as well, and uh, and him being an idol to those guys is is true and, and amazing. And so that, that was really tragic. And, and in regards to Chris Simon, man, I mean, look at how many years he played in the national hockey league and even over in, in the KHL as well. Like what yeah. a tremendous career this guy has had, you know, from, from playing with the audio Ottawa 67s in the OHL in 88, all the way to 2013. I mean, this guy had a tremendous career and say what you want about bruisers, say what you want about quote unquote goons in the national hockey league. He did more than just that. He contributed offensively a little bit. He was a power forward. I would argue more of a power forward than he was just a straight goon as well. Like he knew the game enough to go over to the KHL and still be a valuable player to the teams that he played on. So rest in peace to both of these guys, man. It's 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 truly it's truly a tragedy. And until we get all the data, until we get all the information, you know, let, let's not push narratives that at this point aren't linked, you know? And, yeah. and, and that's my biggest thing. And at the end of the day, and I was going off about this on, on Twitter as well, which I probably should have just you know, walked away, but I feel like there's just a demographic of hockey fans who whose sole priority is to just wait for something like this to happen and then pounce on it. And, and what I want to say to those people is, if you really care, really care about athletes' brain health, then let's collectively fucking cancel boxing. Because at the end of the day, that is the most dangerous most dangerous sport out there. It's more dangerous than, than NFL football. It's more dangerous than hockey. It's more dangerous than MMA. It's more dangerous than Muay Thai. If you take fucking 200 to 500 strikes to the head every single fight, you are going to get brain damage. It, no if, ends or buts, dude. You are going to get brain damage. And why I'm getting emotional about this is I, you know, I, I obviously cover fights on my second channel, The City Life Project, and I covered, called, and watched live one of the one of the best fights. And I can't even believe I'm saying this, but one of the best fights of the year. Two young Japanese kids just went fucking at it, man. They went to war for the duration of the fight. And right after the fight, man, right after the fight, and someone in my live chat said this. Kazuki Anaguchi started wobbling a little bit and had to be pretty much carried out of the ring. Now, he lost the fight a close decision. He was 23 years of age, 6-1. and 6-1 and one as a pro and didn't have a long amateur career either. He was knocked down four times in that 10-round war and went right to the hospital, right into a coma, and a month later, he died. And so if we really, if we really want to start to make some noise... And I get hockey's our sport, but if we care about athletes' help, which is the argument that I've been seeing mostly around social media in you know these news articles, then let's fucking cancel boxing, man. Let's start there because I feel like that will make a bigger statement because these guys are dying every year at a young age versus NFL players, NHL players who are, and I'm not saying it's more or less tragic, but it's happening now, right now, every year. And it's proof in the pudding rather than athletes who are having poor quality of life later in their life. And I feel like that's more of a pressing issue and something that could maybe make change right away. And it's not like it's, boxing is not on the rise right now. You know, you can't cancel the NFL. You can't cancel the National Hockey League. But I feel like people can make enough noise where people start just moving the MMA route or, you know, the, the kickboxing route or the Muay Thai route versus continuing to glorify boxing is like the professional fight uh, fighting style out there. Yeah. I don't know. I, uh, well, well Sorry, I got passionate about that, but again, I, I, that, that watching that kid, man, that just like, I'm like, I'm fucking getting emotional. Just talking about it right now. Like that was tough. Cause I was the one praising that shit. Right. And I'm the one praising hockey fights. And so I'm 
I'm constantly like in the middle of this argument, but that one, fuck, that one, that one was tough, man. That one was tough. Like I said, at, at the end of the day, we just, we never want to see this happen and nothing but love, prayers, support to both Colt Sov and, and Chris Simon's family. I just, I just had to get this out, Seth. I just had yeah. to get this out there and, and kind of talk about this, even, even just personally talk through this as well, because I'm, I'm always in the middle of this, uh, this conversation and it's, uh, yeah. And, and it's a tough one. It's a tough mm -hmm. one. Yeah, but it's a hard right turn. Let's take it. Positive news here. Um, Austin Matthews, uh, second time in three seasons that this kid, I guess he's not even a kid anymore. This young man has reached the 60 goal milestone. Now I'm the biggest Toronto Maple Leafs hater out there. But but I hate the crest. I hate <laughs> I hate Toronto sports. I hate the team. I don't necessarily hate the players. And how can you not love what this guy's doing in this league? I mean, he's one of the premier players in it. Um, maybe not the, well, I don't know. I don't even want to go down that road. Like one of the more premier goal scorers that we have right now. And, um, you know, just a huge reason as to, you can talk about um, the Maple Leafs, and their inability to get past the first round of the postseason, but they have been a playoff caliber team ever since he got there and just does things that few players in this league can do. And the fact that he is one of the few multi goal, multi 60 goal season scorers in the NHL currently is not an accident. Like he's, he's just an outrageous talent and Toronto fans, I'm sure are, uh, breathing a sigh of relief that he didn't end up um he didn't end up upping and leaving to uh to Arizona um yeah I was rats. Would. rats coyotes missed out on that one no they he's one of the him, they should just gave him a part of the team went full Lemieux you can have 30 percent of the, the team ownership <laughs> give him 30 million a year and just say half of it half of it will be invested into the team over a five-year period there you go there you go um, so I got a question for you because everyone's saying that okay, this is this is Ovechkin 2.0. You know, Ovechkin has passed the baton to Austin Matthews, and now Austin Matthews is the best goal scorer in the NHL. I would say personally that he's not a direct Ovechkin example. If anything, he 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 might be more of a Crosby in that he brings not only the goal scoring, but he also is a an elite playmaker as well. As if you look at his stats, it's pretty even. If he's scoring 40 goals, he's scoring like 60 you know 60 assists right yeah um or so so my question uh to bring it back full circle do you think he's more of an ovi a crosby or his own unique now player as far as he's, comparisons go he's his own unique guy like this is this is something that i kind of get frustrated with sometimes is the desire to compare players at any given time to any other player at any other given time of any part of the history of a sport. Like I, I am beyond tired of the uh, Kobe MJ LeBron debate in the NBA. Like these guys are doing their own thing at different times in NHL history. Um, it's, it just so happens that we are seeing some intersection between Ovechkin, between Crosby and Austin Matthews, but they're doing it different ways. And it is a style that is reflective of kind of where the game is going at this point with a uh, more of an emphasis on offense. But, you know, Austin Matthews is Austin Matthews. And he is one of the, you know, probably five best players in the league right now. Um, oh yeah five or ten depending on and that's another thing that kind of i i roll at sometimes is lists rankings well there's um, so many players like this isn't the yeah. nba like you can make a top 10 nba easy because you know there's, there's not many starters but you look in hockey there's there's so many right so. yeah it's it, he's he's one of the best players i feel like the easy the easy test is just asking yourself is he one of the best players in the nhl and it's either an immediate yes or an immediate no there's no in between and you just take all the guys that's an immediate. Yeah. Yes. And you throw them into one column and there's your faces of the NHL. And he is squarely one of them. Yeah. I stand corrected by the way he, uh, he's actually only once ever been close to having the same amount of assists as he does goals. He's always up in goals, 
but why I why I even said that before even uh, looking at it, even the hockey DB was up in front of me was just because he doesn't necessarily play that way, right? Like he yeah. he doesn't just like like where Ovi just lines up into his office, gets in front of the net. Now Ovi does do a lot more out there, throwing the body around historically and still currently today, right? Like he'll 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 put his team on on his back and you know try to make some plays as well and obviously get those second secondary and, and first assists. But I feel like Austin Matthews is like a, a step of not above in talent above in as far as being a better player, but above that in he transcends just being a goal scorer, despite his stats reflecting that he's just a goal scorer. And that's where, you know, bringing the whole Crosby versus OV, not even rivalry, but like comparison throughout their in, entire year or entire a playing career, a little bit less now than it was when they first like hit the scene in the National Hockey League. But that, that's why I kind of brought Crosby into the mix because there's years where Crosby will like go on an absolute goal tear, but still be the Sidney Crosby, the setup king, that guy who yeah. sees the ice like like no one else in, in the National Hockey League. And I feel like Matthews does have those type of traits as well, where he plays like a complete player, but just has that magic touch in more than just the office, quote unquote, uh, like Ovechkin has. Yeah, and he is very much kind of a take like take the lead type guy on that Toronto team. And so um, as a result, he gets a ton of the opportunities that maybe some of the other guys in that group don't get to where Crosby is. Like you said, he's facilitating a lot of times to his wings. Um, it's just, it's just a bunch of guys just, just cooking in the uh, cooking in the lab and scoring a ton of goals. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. One more quick thing I want, that we want to dive into here, Seth. And uh, next week, there, there are two other stories that I wanted to bring forth this week, but we've already gone over the time that, uh, that I thought we would be uh, taking on this podcast. So again, next week, we're going to dive into that uh, Philly goalie story, uh, Fedotov, with a great, uh, great and wacky story around Ivan Fedotov and his entry into the National Hockey League. And shoot, just his hockey playing career right now. And one of the rare occasions where a WHL player, that's right, a major junior player, was uh, suspended for performance-enhancing drugs. Now, we don't... I'm used to seeing that in the fight game. Not used to seeing that much in the hockey world, let alone at the junior level. So we're going to unpack both of those stories next week before this becomes old news. And since this was a hot, hot topic on Twitter this last week, let's end the show with this, Seth. Let's talk about uh our dear friend andrew b <laughs> miss me with the zach hyman story right now listen i've been in the media industry since around 2012 maybe a little bit longer than that uh, but professionally since 2012 and frankly it's not just about hockey it's not just about sports our media industry has to do a better job of telling truthful stories all right and listen Zach Hyman scored 50 goals at age 31. Fantastic accomplishment. Incredible. But the story that's being sold right now and repeated ad nauseum all over media is that, you know, if you work hard, if you stick to it, you can get there too. 31-year-old guy finally hit the 50-goal mark. Hard worker, all that. Yeah, great. Except you're missing the part of the story where Zach Hyman grew up insanely rich where his parents bought an entire league to guarantee him playing time, where he did exclusive training that only a rich person could perform, or sorry, that only a rich person could afford with, you know, professional athletes his whole life. His whole life. This is a person who has had every single possible advantage to get where they are today. And by the way, on top of that, got extraordinarily lucky once making the league and has spent almost the entirety of his NHL career, playing shotgun next to Austin Matthews or Connor McDavid. Un like objectively, inarguably, the two best players in the sport right now for his whole career, his whole career. Now, none of that takes away the fact that he scored 50 goals. He scored 50 goals, it's not going away. Zach Hyman is a hard worker, right? You can see it on the ice. He goes into spots that are hard to get to, that you take a beating to get to, but Let's be real here. Hard work, stick to itiveness. That isn't the story. The story is if you have that stuff and you have every possible opportunity, every possible lucky break, every possible financial consideration, then, then 
maybe your hard work will get to you to where Zach Hyman got. It's not about just working hard. And this is not just hockey. It's not just sports. This is everything. Working hard, everybody works hard. You think every NHLer didn't get there by working hard? You think every NBA player didn't get there by working hard? Talent, of course. But you can't have elite talent without working hard, at least in some way. Not all of them will work hard the same way. But Zach Hyman, let's be real here, is a hardworking player, hard-nosed player, who goes to one space on the ice, for the most part offensively, and he contributes in one specific way. That specific way at the net front s happens to mesh extremely well with hyper elite generational players to become a complementary piece on a top line. He's not a guy that drives a line. He's not a 50 goal scorer in the same way that a guy like Austin Matthews is a 50 goal scorer. He's a 50 goal scorer in the right situation with the right line mates. Not everybody who is Zach Hyman's talent could fold himself into that role and execute it as well as Zach Hyman does, and he absolutely deserves credit for that. But let's not build this stupid narrative of, work hard, you'll succeed. It's just not true. It's just not true. There are people who've worked as hard as Zach Hyman their entire lives and never got a sniff of the American Hockey League, let alone the NHL, because they didn't have the advantages that he had, or something went wrong in their career that didn't go wrong for his. So yes, congratulations to Zach Hyman on your 50 goals, but I'm sorry, the narrative you're selling and that the media is selling around it, miss me with that. It's bullshit. Wow. A lot to unpack there. A lot to unpack there. So that was Andrew Berkshire, host of Game Over Montreal and the Cross Check NHL show. He's also done some work for SDPN and he's been a part of that hockey media uh, for a while now. Now, I these are my just high level takeaways from that Seth and we'll we'll unpack them and I'll get yours as well but first and foremost like this guy n at least on some level knew what he was doing he knew this would cause yeah. a ruckus he even said that in the video two i don't disagree with the overall point that especially and and this is strictly because this is where i grew up from a canadian perspective if you don't come from an affluent family, you're in like the bottom 5% of even having a chance just due to, if you're not in skills development at five, six years old, you know, you're not making, you're not making the, the highest level um, league, the highest level camps, the highest level teams. And, you know, by 10, 11, if you're just not that naturally gifted as well as, you know, the work ethic, you're just never getting the call. Furthermore, you have to pay to play even in junior B leagues in Canada. And I've worked in junior B leagues where I saw kids just rip it up, like 80 point players in 30 games who got invites to WHL camps whose parents just quite simply could not afford them to go. So like in Canada, I understand the point, but his execution here was awful. It made no sense of him going after one player, even if his excuse was, will I cover... Montreal and Toronto. I watch these guys, you know, more more than any other player. Fine, but it doesn't that doesn't excuse you could bring in more examples and I think it should have been if he really cared about getting this point across, which again, I'm passionate about this point too, why not fucking do it in print or a full yeah. like YouTube video? Yeah. I do get that he was riding the quote unquote SEO wave of Zach Hyman scoring his 50 goals. People are talking about it now. If I put this video out, it's going to catch fire. My only critique of him overall is like, why didn't you fucking post it on YouTube so you could make some monetization money, baby? Because you ain't making shit on YouTube or on uh, Twitter. But uh, that, that's high level what I took away with it or took away from it, Seth. Um, wh where do you want to start? Here's my thoughts on this because Sam Reinhart scored 50 goals. Sam Reinhart has a rich family. Nylander. And again, I get the sentiment that there is a lot of this that happens. We see it here in the States too. There's a lot of, I'm going to pay whatever I need to do to get my son or daughter seen by the right people. That's the takeaway here is what he was trying to get across is that getting to 
the collegiate level, getting to the minor league level and the NHL level, those opportunities afforded him the ability to be seen by the right people. My overarching sentiment on this is if he gets to if he gets to those levels under false pretenses like he was still drafted in the 5th round if he is an NHL player that doesn't have some level of skill he's not going to last he's not going to like being a line mate for Austin Matthews and Connor McDavid they don't just throw anybody in those spots. Like you have to have a certain level of being able to keep up. We saw it here. Victor Rask was a perfect example. We have a good one right now in Marcus Johansson of guys who it feels like are kind of hanging on for dear life as part of a line combination. Like I attack this, attack the system miss me with going after one player specifically like i i think you have to i think zach hyman being able to stick at the nhl level is a testament to the work that he put in when he got here did he have some extra opportunities to be seen and get put in a position to be drafted and to get into the nhl level sure but like it would be like what he's what is being insinuated is like if I would be put in the same like right now in my it completely negative athletic build would be put in a similar situation and thrown on a line with with Connor McDavid and be able to do the same thing. Like you have to have a certain level of skill and talent Absolutely. to be able to do that. And so um it, that should have been the point of attack, I think, for this. I, I think, and it's funny too, the response, like the number of people who go out of their way to say that Zach Hyman's one of the nicest players they've ever been around. If you saw any of the reaction to seeing him score his 50th goal, his teammates could not have been more excited for him yeah. to do that. And so it's it's shitty that it took away from that milestone. Like do a huge expose and do it sometime after like, and include other players who have been given opportunities kind of above and beyond what everybody else has. Like, that's the thing that should be focused on. Don't focus on situations in which it's pretty clear that Zach Hyman has some high level of work ethic and skill to be able to stick at the NHL level at this point. And two Canadian markets. Uh, yeah. Edmonton, Toronto, right? Like if he doesn't have if he doesn't have the talent, he's not gonna stick. That's my big point. Is like yep. sure it got him to the NHL level, those opportunities, but like it, you can't you can't bullshit your way into an NHL career. Like you have to have something that you're good at to be able to keep you there. Like yeah, no, the, for sure. Being a net front guy, having that be the only thing that he brings to the table is just an incredible, like, it's just an incredible undersell. Um, I mean, honestly, I don't know. Like, I, I actually got more angry even watching it the second time. Like, and it was right up until the point that he started to really dive into Hyman himself that I'm just like, okay, like... When he said hard work doesn't matter, that's when I was just like, like yeah. what are you, what are you talking about? Yeah, it like, absolutely does. It absolutely does. And uh, again, I'll push back on the fact that like uh, maybe him doing it after like I, from a content creator's perspective, I, I would say no, Seth, this was the perfect time to do it, but do it properly. Yep. Whether you want guys want to call it clickbait or whatever, draw people in with the Hyman example, then give more examples. And rather than the focus being on the players who were, who got those opportunity, make the focus on those who didn't. Mm -hmm. Because there's such a big percent. And again, I'm going through, this is looking at it through a Canadian perspective, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I grew up with talented, talented hockey players. Like I never played at any sort of high level, but I, I, I grew up with kids whose parents were like, 
I know you love it. I know you work hard, but I'm going to send you to college. I ain't going to send you to this camp. I ain't going to send you to the skills thing. I'm not going to keep buying skates for you both time and time again. Like, I'm sorry. That's the path that I want you to go down because I'm not going to roll the dice on you being a National Hockey League player or a pro hockey player when we don't necessarily have that fuck you money to, to, to allow that to happen. And I think that being the focus would have been so much more fruitful. You can draw from other examples. Now I know Nylander didn't hit 50 goals, but like the Ny- Nylander, if we're going to talk about, you know, a, a team that you cover more in Toronto, there's one as well. Right. Yeah. So I think that should have been the focus Hey, on those who were as talented as worked just as hard, but through a fu- the, the financial atmosphere, that is the, the world of hockey, given that it is a, wealthy person sport it is an expensive sport it's one of the most expensive sports that focus on those and try to find people's stories who couldn't make it because of that you know do some investigative research yeah you know There's and a- and and if this was boiling to be able to drop during this because again i have no we're content creators i have no problem with riding the new cycle wave riding the seo wave and dropping it at that time that's not my issue if because if I was if I was in his position and wanted to actually do this right, I would have dropped it at that exact same time too, because that's just strategic. Yeah. But the execution was absolutely insane. Yeah, and that graph in the second video. I didn't really want to make this video tonight, but I realized that tomorrow I'm really busy and I don't want to leave this too long because frankly, a lot of people are upset. And I realized my mistake and I got to correct it. So... I come at everything as an analyst. That's what I do. That's how I write about hockey. I like to reach in, pull things apart, figure out why things are the way they are. But the video that I was doing talking about Zach Hyman wasn't about analysis. It was about media criticism. And I let a very real reservation that I have about Zach Hyman's career in how I analyze him and place him in like my personal rankings of where players fit uh be part of that video when it had no place there so when i talked about zach hyman going from austin matthews to Connor mcdavid and putting but being put in these situations that are extraordinarily lucky this is something that i do think about when i think about what is zach hyman compared to the rest of his peers in the nhl how does he stack up do the goal totals make sense but in that video it's irrelevant Right, We're not talking about Zach Hyman in terms of what he is as a player. What I'm talking about is when we build this, these kinds of mythologies about players, what kinds of stories are we telling? What kinds of stories are we being told? What kinds of stories are we willing to accept? And a lot of people pointed out, you know, why talk about Zach Hyman? Well, it was simply I read a couple columns that had this hero work hard bootstrap style uh, narrative going on around Zach Hyman. He just scored his 50th. He's the topic du jour. Yeah, Sam Reinhart also just scored his 50th, but he plays in South Florida. I don't read as many columns about the Florida Panthers, but we can talk about Sam Reinhart. Uh, Now, does he have the same level of wealth in his family that Zach Hyman does? No, but his dad was a former player. It's It's a different kind of privilege, and there are a lot of that. There's a lot of that in hockey, in sports. That's a different kind of privilege, but it's not as straightforward as Zach Hyman's is, right? Zach Hyman's history is well documented, and it's a pretty simple thing to look at and say, okay, these doors were opened for him by this. He still had to work hard to make it. That's implicit in making it. And we know from watching Zach Hyman and his style of play, he's a hard-ass worker. You don't score those kinds of goals without being willing to take punishment. It's not about whether or not Zach Hyman works hard. It's about how hard a lot of kids work who don't get to make it. And that has to be a consistent part of the stories that we tell about the NHL. Now, I got to show you why. Now, it's the middle of the night and my in-laws are here, so forgive the fact that I had to draw a shitty graph instead of make it on my computer and put it in the background and be all nice. But anyway, here is uh, based on a Globe and Mail article I read using the census data from 2021 and the government's own statistics, how Canada's population breaks down in terms of uh, wealth distribution, right? How they create different uh, class designations so billionaires not really relevant here billionaires are more nhl owners they don't seem that concerned with putting their kids in hockey 
but they make up just 63 of the 38 million people in Canada. Millionaires, 7.6. Upper class, 12.4%. Upper middle class, uh, 20%. Then lower middle, 20%. Working poor. They called this uh, lower class, I think, or something, or like lower middle. But there's no such thing as middle middle. It's upper middle and lower middle. So working poor, 20%. And people who live in poverty now, right? In current Canada around 20% and the government won't say that that's the poverty line but let's be real here if you're making under 28k in Canada you can't afford very much so here's what that looks like quick and dirty not exact just illustrative not scientific what that looks like as a distribution of the population uh, the billionaires realistically you wouldn't even be able to see the black line on there it's just there to put put it there millionaires of course make up that shelf now most of the players in the NHL are going to come from this area here, upper class and higher, right? That's the people who have some money to kind of put into getting their kids inexpensive programs, right? There's nothing wrong with Zach Hyman being from this class. A lot of uh, players in the NHL are from this class too. There are a lot of players that are from this class as well. There are some players who are from this upper middle class too. Usually if you've got a kid who's really good at hockey, who you think could be an NHL or in this class, this is where it's going to become difficult and where you're going to have to make personal sacrifices that maybe you don't want to make, but you'll do it for your kid because you truly believe in them. This is where it starts to get tough, right? In the lower middle class, at this stage, you're going to have to make big life sacrifices. It's not just about time anymore, about commitment to get to the rink on time, to get ice time. This is like, you're going to have to give up a hobby you're gonna to have to sell something maybe to get your kid into the right program to get to to the NHL this is extremely difficult now there are some NHLers who are going to be from these two classes here as well but it's going to be rare this is going to be people whose community rallied behind them because they were so unbelievably obviously good that people didn't give up or it could be a parent or two parents who just would not take no for an answer the point that i think a lot of people don't get isn't that rich people being in the nhl or their kids being in the nhl is a bad thing the point is that more and more in hockey that's the only route and i don't think if we ignore that when we talk about these players that it's a good thing. I think we need to be hyper aware of that and hyper vigilant of that. And maybe I didn't communicate that in the best way with Zach Hyman, but we could pick any of many players in the league who have grown up very wealthy and had that run to their advantage. Connor McDavid, right? And Connor McDavid also has a genetic advantage that he is just, you know, some some of that is from hard work. Absolutely, to be skilled, to be that skilled, you got to practice, put in so many hours. But some of it is just. He's an athlete. He would have been good at any sport, you know. So there's that to consider as well. But you talk to people in minor hockey, and it's a constant struggle to find kids to sign up for registration in Canada. This is becoming a big problem for hockey. And, man, like I love hockey. I, I truly do. It's been a huge part of my life. But I, I see that this is an issue in hockey, and I think it's ahead of where we are in other areas. But across Canada, this is becoming the norm. To get to the higher levels of areas, you have to be starting at the end, right? You have to have that jump. And I'm not somebody who's had uh, no breaks in my life. I've had plenty of breaks. For a, a good period, my parents were in that upper middle class territory, right? I'd admit that without any... Uh, without any hesitation for the last couple of years I've been in that lower middle area and so is my wife we were doing okay but uh, you know COVID is pinching all of us and Canada is getting more and more unaffordable and hockey is just ahead of the game on that and I, I just think when you're calling yourself a journalist and this kind of stuff is not just an afterthought but full-on offensive to bring up in the context of a player's accomplishments, it's a bad thing. It's a really bad thing. And I'll, t I'll own it 
that I didn't communicate everything perfectly and that maybe it seemed like a personal attack on Zach Hyman, which it wasn't. I like Zach Hyman. He's a good player. I like watching him. Congrats to him for scoring 50. But I think it's very telling that there were a few people who made sure that the first thing they mentioned was the Zach Hyman thing, and then they mentioned the media part. Because really, it is about a media criticism, and it's not about a single guy. It's about institutionally, we have to do better on this kind of stuff. Oh my God, talk about burying yourself after. Yeah, not great. Like he could have come out and said exactly what we said. Hey, my approach was wrong, blah, blah, blah. You know, and just kind of, I, I will follow up on it in print or on a podcast or in a YouTube video coming up here, whatever. Yeah. Just let me get X, Y, and, you know, get let me get X, Y, and Z. And people would still be angry, but at least there's like, okay, there's a chance for you to further explain slash redeem yourself versus that fucking joke of a video last thing i want to just say on this seth and I, I have to bring it up here again i appreciate you staying on because this has been a longer show but to go back to like people jumping on a narrative and making this political or again just feeding a narrative that is absolutely ridiculous like this is just given fuel to mr andrew brewer's fire that andrew berkshire is an anti-semitic and hates jewish people because of his a few tweets supporting Palestine, for example. Now, I'm not here to get political. This is a situation that despite me being very much into global news, into Middle Eastern conflict, just given my family's from the Middle East, it's just something that I personally nerd out about and love to stay informed with. I will admit I don't understand fully what's going on there either, and none of us will. So the fact that people are making accusations that despite how much of a piece of shit he might be, that he's an anti-Semitic and going back to 2011 to find fucking tweets of his that have questionable language in it, but have no context to replies of the tweet. And I'll put it on screen here. No context into it being from a point of attack or just in response to something because the original tweet has been deleted. And then just jumping that because he supports this or supports that or doesn't want to see kids die on either side that he hates Jewish people. That's the most cop out fucking cowardly fucking riding on a political narrative shit that I've ever seen. And that irks me, man, because we just had a proper conversation, a proper breakdown of that. Did we mention once that this guy hates Jewish people? No. If you believe that. And I'm not speaking on behalf of Seth, but if you believe that, I think you're a fucking fool at the end of the day. That's that's my piece on that. I, I That was ridiculous, man. Seth's going to plead the fifth as he should, as he should. Anyways, Seth, as always, man, this has been fun. I know this has been a little bit more of an intense episode, but I appreciate you riding shotgun with me. Like I said, it's, it's good to at least have someone reel me back in at times and uh, be a soundboard when, you know, rather than just me screaming into a camera or mic by myself. And uh, I really do respect you a lot, man, and appreciate you giving me this time and jumping on here every single week. I say this every time. This is this is the, my, my favorite part of the week is jumping on Locked on Wild and uh, and the Soda Pod. And I'm excited to dive into some more funky stories next week. But yeah. uh, until then, what do you have coming up on Locked on Wild this week, sir? We'll dive into the April schedule. Um, the final schedule preview of the year for Locked on Wild. Hard to believe we're at that point already. And uh, I've got some fun coming up with the Locked on Senators boys. Uh, they are coming to town for the uh, the game tomorrow against the Senators. So I will be taking things in as a fan for tomorrow's game. First time I've done that since taking over as host. So uh, should be a lot of fun. We'll have some content for you throughout the game. Dude, I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait for that. And I can't wait for us to link up next week as well as Seth will be covering the game live on Saturday. I will be uh, there celebrating my birthday with the boys. And uh, I got a nice care package to send Seth home with as well. Look at me giving out gifts on my birthday. But um, I know, Seth, it's long overdue, man. And we get spoiled by all of our brewery partners and friends out here, especially with me doing the hoppy hour segment. So I want to just, just again, to say thank you for everything that you've done to support the Soda Pod and now us kind of being co-hosts on this collaboration uh weekly both locked on and 
that one episode on Locked On and Soda Pod here. It's uh, yeah, I I want I want to hook you up with something here. I know you're a big beer drinker like me, and uh, <laughs> I've been I've been slowly br- I've been slowly like picking and choosing stuff that I'm like, okay, Seth will like this, Seth will like this. So um, so yeah, so I'm excited to see you next week. Excited yeah. for the hockey game and excited to see what you got coming up with the boys from Locked On Senators, guys. Again, go subscribe to Seth Seth's channel, Locked On Wild, doing amazing things over there daily videos, live streams every week, watch parties throughout the games, and uh, yours truly every Friday um, joining Seth on the podcast as well. And then if you're just an audio listener, if you're not a big YouTube guy, again, Seth posts it, um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from. So go check him out there. Again, sorry for going long, Seth. Thank you for being my soundboard, and uh, we'll see you back uh, next week. Hey, Seth, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for... Uh, practicing patience with me as we did go a little long on this episode he only pled the fifth in one segment so hey that's not too bad when you're dealing with a crazy fuck like myself guys go check out seth's work locked on wild on youtube and if you're not a big youtube guy if you're listening to this right now and you're like well i'll listen to his podcast i'm not a big youtube guy hell i'm not even watching you on youtube right now isha or anything of the soda pod you can find any and all of his episodes on any podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Well, I guess you can't find it on Stitcher anymore. Rest in peace. You can find it everywhere, ladies and gentlemen, and a big shout out to Seth. It's 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 my favorite part of the week, linking up with Seth every Sunday, or in this case, Monday, to record the show. And I am super honored that he invites me on his show for his Friday episode every week on Locked On Wild. So if if you can't get enough of me, if you can't get enough of this face, this beautiful voice, um, I even laugh at that, then you can find me on Locked On Wild every Friday hanging out with Seth. It's, It's a really cool collaboration that we're doing. The Soda Pod, Locked On Wild, and I really appreciate Seth for... Give me a little bit of his time every week, and it's an absolute honor to give him some of mine. Before we wrap up the show here, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to give a big shout out to our friends at Better Edge. Big shout out to Better Edge for hosting our MNCAA bracket this year. Big shout out to Better Edge for all the work that they do throughout the Hockey Frozen Four and March Madness. This is a big, big event. This is a big time for them, and they are doing incredible things there at Better Edge. Go to betteredge.com slash soda pod. Sign up and receive a $20 signing bonus to play around with. Again, that's betteredge.com slash Sota pod. We host multiple games and events now on Better Edge and more to come. We obviously have our game day pick them where you can choose seven out of 10 points. That's money line, player point totals, and more $5 entry, winner take all. And like I said, they have been hosting our MNCAA bracket this year. And we had a ton of people sign up. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all the support. And thank you for supporting them as well. I hope you went on betteredge.com slash soda pod. That way you can you could have used $20 to play around with $20 to enter our bracket. Or I guess it was less than $20. So you got some left in the bank. It's a free platform with legal. That is right. Legal betting in the great state of Minnesota among 44 other states as well. And if you're just loving this platform, much like I am, you can become a premium player. Check out Better Edge Premium. Premium players have access to free entry to premium pick em contests, order grades, advanced order filtering, API access, and more. More details at betteredge.com slash premium. But if you're new to Better Edge, be sure to go to betteredge.com slash SodaPod. Get your sign-up bonus, play around, and fall in love with this amazing app like we have. Local company, amazing people. You can see the trend with the brands that we work with here on the SodaPod. Better Edge, a proud partner of the soda pod that's it ladies and gentlemen that is the show went a little bit longer here today i hope you enjoyed the hoppy hour vlog i hope you enjoyed seth topol as always again best part of my week is linking up with my friend seth and i'm very excited to literally link up with him this weekend i will be at saturday's minnesota wild game i'll likely be at either 
bad weather or barrel theory beforehand. I'll probably be at Tom Reed's after. So hit me up again at VI Sports Talk on Twitter, at SodaPod on Twitter, or just comment here on YouTube if you're watching. And a big shout out to everybody who supports us on YouTube. You guys are loving these SodaPod episodes, and I love producing them and making them for you guys. If you're just on the audio side, that's fine too. I appreciate you. Don't forget to leave a rating and a review as it just gets our podcast, the audio side of things, in front of more listeners. And if you're watching on YouTube, Thank you so much for helping this channel get above 1,000 subscribers. And we're continuing to grow. It's amazing. I really appreciate every single one of you. Don't forget to like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're just watching this for the first time. And leave a comment as like, rating, and reviewing on the audio side of things. If you like and comment these videos, you just get us in front of more people. You help the algorithmo. YouTube thanks you. Isha thanks you, and the whole team here at the Soda Pod thanks you. MNCAA drops every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Fellowship of the Rink every Wednesday. Shout out to Hoppy and Joe Smith doing amazing things on that podcast. And Judd's Buds every Friday via audio form. It will be on our podcast feed, but again, you can find the live show on YouTube where you can be totally interactive with the gang there. It was a long weekend, ladies and gentlemen literally and figuratively, but we got through it. I hope you all had a tremendous Easter. I hope you all got to have some nice food, a nice break from the hustle bustle. And if you didn't spend it with friends and family, I hope you just took the time you needed to recharge. No snow this last weekend. It was all melting. The sun was shining. And again, happy Easter. I hope you all had an amazing time. And again, thank you, thank you. A thousand times thank you. You all are amazing. I appreciate you all. Signing off, I'm Isha Jeromi alongside Seth Topo. This has been the Soda Pod presented by our friends at Better Edge, 7th Avenue Pizza, Northland Vodka, and Waggle Golf. Don't fear, just drink some beer and stay wild.